uh, if you want to speak at the meetup, very welcome. Just contact us, me or Peter. Where is Peter? Over there. Um, please contact us because we really want to help people getting on stage. This, think of this as a, like a test for your uh, Kubecon talk. By the way, the call for paper for Kubecon ends the 4th of December. So if you, don't, if you haven't submitted your talk, do it. And if you don't know how to do it, contact me or Peter, uh, and we can help you out. We can tell you how to do it and the, the tips and tricks of submitting a talk. Today, we're going to have one talk from Alcide. And then we're going to try to do two things. It's a bit, we lost a speaker just a couple of days ago, so we couldn't find any, any replacement. Sorry for that. But lucky, luck wants that uh, there's a bunch of people over in San Diego attending Kubecon. And the live stream of the keynote happens right at 8, eight o'clock. So maybe we, should, we can catch that. And otherwise, we're going to open the floor for Q&A, a panel discussion. So think about something you want to discuss, some questions you have about Kubernetes, adoption, technical questions, the commu community. Just think of something we can be open to discuss it with the with large group. We are just a small community, so it's good to know each other and, uh, and have an open discussion about that. So without further ado, somebody from True wants to introduce the company and the brand new Kubernetes service. Um, good evening, welcome. Um, was anyone here earlier this year when we had the first meetup here? Ah, cool, welcome back. Uh, hopefully many more Kubernetes meetups here at the office uh, at True. Um, I have a small introduction as to who True is. So uh, besides we have a cool office, everyone will know at the end of the evening what we do. And uh, if you might want to come back sometime, let me just grab the uh, remote. Ah, this is the, the welcoming. Uh, after me comes Super Amir, and he has a, a cool story about security, but only critical security updates, if I'm right. Um, let's continue. Introduction to True, for the people who don't know us yet, we're uh, a managed hosting provider. We started around 2000, so we've been around quite a while uh, in terms of internet age. Nowadays, we're with one over 150 people. And we're mainly delivering either managed hosting for web applications or also delivering um, virtual workspaces, which is more into the yeah, productivity of people and more into the Microsoft uh, theme. However, most of us that are here tonight are from the web application side, which we think is the cooler card of the internet. Um, so you, you see a few of the branches that we're doing it for. Uh, and yeah, most of our customers are more uh, high-end companies who really require the 24-7 uptime as such. Um, we got a small introduction of where we came from. This uh, server here just um, seems like one server. And yeah, for the companies that grew with us, we started with one server, made them redundant to clusters, and just kept extending it as we go. Um, this is something we're still doing for a lot of companies that aren't ready to go to either Kubernetes or some public cloud service yet. So it might seem old-fashioned, uh, old but it Definitely isn't. Um, but this is uh, a small overview of the customers that we're helping. Um, for the people who are from the Netherlands, there are uh, quite a few names that we're quite proud of. Uh, but now to Kubernetes, of course. Uh, last year, we started uh, building a team um, without having an idea of what we're actually going to do. We just knew that a lot of, of our customers wanted to start doing something with containers and Kubernetes in production. So um, our board gave us the room to start a, a small team and just start developing stuff and see, hey, uh, what is something that we can deliver to our customers? So nowadays, um, we actually have a professional service. It launched back in uh, May. So we've been around now for like half a year in production phase, which runs, uh, if I can say, it's very cool and very smoothly. And these are some of the things that we're actually helping customers with. Um, as you saw in the previous image, a lot of our customers are still using uh, servers uh, with Apache and MySQL clusters, which are still, yeah, how do you say, monoliths, and they aren't ready yet to go to a microservice architecture and using Kubernetes uh, to the footage that you shoot. So for a lot of these companies, we're actually uh, helping them with onboarding training, showing them how it actually works, or we can help them building pipelines, 
because some of our customers don't even have CI CD in place, which is of course very important to even start using containers. Um, and what we're now really moving towards and for 2020 is, yeah, we, uh, we're still thinking of a cool name, but in general it's called Managed DevOps, where we want to help customers more and more into um, uh, showing them what they really want to do and should do, develop cool applications, and at the end of the day, we will deploy it for them, make sure that the pipeline uh, runs, and that at the end, either a container comes out, a uh, public cloud service, or if you still need it, just some code on, uh, on a virtual or dedicated server. Um, so we have a small overview of the stuff we do. Managed Kubernetes, of course, which is why we're actually here and uh, why we're really investing in the community. Uh, manage public cloud hosting as well as doing it at our own data center. So if you still want to use Kubernetes but don't want to use an American cloud provider, we, can, we have built our own platform for it. Uh, and we also have a lot of cool stuff in terms of security. So we have a pen testing team, but we're also building services like web, web application firewalling. And now, of course, the, the managed DevOps part. Um, if you want to uh, have a talk, we have quite a few of our guys over here. In the back there is Daniel, one of our uh, awesome Kubernetes engineers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, over there we have Eddie, our senior uh, security engineer, and uh, quite a few guys who run around with a true shirt if you have any questions. Um, and we're also looking for a lot of tech talent to actually help us uh, keep growing and helping customers. These are just a few uh, of the vacancies we have open, but you're more than uh, open to apply here and uh, join us. Or if you have another question or need some help with Kubernetes, please don't hesitate to uh, hit us up. And now I would like to give the stage to uh, Amir. Super Amir, sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm Amir. I'm uh, with Al Cid. I uh, arrived today from uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. And I'm going to talk today about continuous uh, Kubernetes security. I'm going to present you with a project that we did um, around certificates and how I clean after myself and keep everything uh, clean and with, without security threat. Uh, and before I'm rushing into this and, and give you this uh, 40 slides uh, marketing uh, material, no, no, no marketing material, I just uh, have a few questions. Um, the way I'm going to ask this is, is if one answer applies, pick up one hand. If uh, both, uh, if you have multiple answers, just do this, and then I'll know you are using both. For example, who has, who's been using Kubernetes today? Wow, this is uh, very not, who's using a managed or unmanaged or both? We got one, two, three, oh. So my goal was to get you guys to do a wave, like I think I got it on video, then now I'm good. Okay. And who's using more than one public cloud? Okay. Okay, that's very good. Cool. The CD part and the security behind it. We're using Let's Encrypt and ACME.sh. It's a GitHub public project that we adopted and, and we liked it a lot. Um, and it's a phrase that I'm uh, always saying is well, my boss is not cheap. He just uh, loves open source. And normally I change that phrase, but I got Adam from Alcide as well here, so I needed to make it a bit more nice. Certificate. You saw it already. <laughs> um, okay, so, so the goal was to get public certificates and to put it on our environment, which our environment is, we have multiple <laughs> Kubernetes clusters worldwide, production, staging, dev, and we needed to use the same um, wildcard certificate. And it becomes a challenge uh, to sync it, to sync between different clusters if you want to use the same certificate. When renewals expired, all that process, and um, we, at the beginning, we thought about using one of the public cloud working, public uh, CAs that are paid, like very, like, um, I'm not going to say names, but most of them are, most of them, the API didn't did exactly what, it, what we wanted it to do. 
and we also didn't want to pay uh, $700 a year for a wildcard certificate. Yes, sir? Good question. So let's say you're running a web service, uh, um, card at moses.com. Moses is just a name, okay? <laughs> We're, we're being recorded, so Moses is just a name. So um, um, card can be uh, as the subdomain, right? And we can be running on multiple servers, like survey A, B, C, D, et cetera. And in our case, it's cluster, Kubernetes cluster A, B, C, D, et cetera. So but instead of generating a certificate per server, a public certificate, which should be presented to our customers, you're presenting a wildcard, asterisk, dot subdomain dot your FQD and your, uh, your domain, Moses or LC. And, and by sharing this certificate, you're, you don't, you're saving a lot of time and you don't need to deal with different services, different certificates, one for everything. It raises security concerns, but it's, it's becoming the industry standards to, to you know, if you're, if you're not bounded by any regulation or, or product um, requirement, you go with wildcard. So traditionally, um, when, you're requesting a wild, when you're requesting a certificate from a public signed CA, you're going via verification process. They make you show a company register document, company ID, and th this process normally takes let's say two weeks or three weeks or even more, you can pay, obviously, for expediting that process, and it's a per certificate or per domain. Let's Encrypt is a public CA. It's a project that I'm soon, next slide, going to talk about, giving you those uh, certificates for free. Um, so we talk about the long verification, one month process, uh, cost per certificate, and dealing with replacing it, okay? It's we, I don't know who's from IT background over here. You can raise your hand if you do, okay? If you, we all forgot about changing the certificates. And when you forgot about it and it's expired, your customers are getting that horrible error saying this is not secure and, 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 and you're rushing into changing it and you need to change it in different places. So you have that dealing with changing as well. Solution, so I said we have the CI part and the CD part. The CI, is, as I'm gonna show it, is uh, Jenkins pipeline of their renewal, checking, and, and validation. And uh, a CD, which is a Helm chart, this is the way we package everything and deploy it into Kubernetes cluster. So if, if, if um, let's say you're working on a Linux and you wanna install a program or whatever, you're doing app install, you get your application, right? So to us, uh, on Kubernetes world, Helm is the equi equivalent. You write Helm chart, install the name of the chart you want, and brings on all the settings, all the configuration needed, and it's installing it to your cluster. So that's the, oops, sorry, that's the, that's the project that we use. It's an open source project by this guy, Neil Tang, and the um, ACME, it's actually the name of the protocol to talk with the CA and get new certificate and do the validation. And that's Encrypt, which is, uh, it's a company based in San Francisco. I lived in San Francisco for seven years, and it's been founded by different world, world uh, class level brands like Cisco and, and, and other companies. Uh, to, to support your project. Um, and again, there's a few more pain points that we faced when we actually wanted to bring it into our city and into onboard and into our cloud. So we had, there is a hard, hard uh, limitation of five requests per week. So if you're developing and you want to use their product, your, their, their public CA, you can ask for the certificate up to five times a week. If you pass that, you need to wait five, you need to wait a week now. So uh, you don't want, if you're doing development, work with their staging environment. If you're on production, 
make sure you're only requesting less than five times or else you're going to wait one, one week. Um, so this was kind of a hard limitation that we had to be focused on. Uh, Multi-cluster implementation, so wildcard certificate, right? You're using the same certificate across your services. But if you have different clusters, now you need to make sure that cluster A would not request a certificate and then cluster B would not request in the same week or at least five of them, right? So it's, it's another thing that we had to start about at the design level. And pod, w yeah, so the, the deployment, right? The deployment was a pod that's running in your Kubernetes and is doing this, requesting the certificate and getting it. And this is one of the artifacts of our design that we had a pod that is running and it has um, access to secrets. Secrets is the where you save all of your secrets in Kubernetes cluster. It's where you store your certificates, your username and password, your credentials to Azure or one of the public clouds. So at the end of the day, that pod had to have very sensitive permissions into reading and writing to the secret repository inside of our Kubernetes, right? So it's another thing that we had in mind, and I'll get to the solution in the next slide. So this is how the pipeline looks. In We're using uh, Jenkins for our CI CD. And the first stage is, is that we're checking if renewal is needed, right? Um, the way it works is as, as we're, getting the, we're getting the expiration date, we're calculating if it's less than 30 days. If it is less than 30 days, the entire pipeline goes into fact, right? We're going to the next step. The next step is downloading that ACME SH project, which take care of the validation. Now, remember we said that validation in, in normal or traditional way is you show them papers, you prove them that you're the owner of that domain, that you're that company, you're actually working for Alcid and you're requesting certificate for Alcid. The way that works is very simple. They'll give you a token with a string inside of it and they'll tell you to put it in your DNS provider. They'll wait 20 seconds and they'll validate it. This is how they know that you're actually who you says you are. So they give you a random string, you put it in your DNS server, They'll check it, they'll get what the answer they expected, they'll give it a certificate. It's that simple. So ACME takes care of that part. It's generating the, the request. You get a token with a DNS entry. You put that DNS entry inside. We're using Azure Public DNS. You put that, you wait 20 seconds. Let's Encrypt, which is the public CIA, goes to Azure DNS, checks it, validates, and the artifact is public signed certificate that you can use on your services. What do we do next? Is we upload it into Azure Blob, which is the equivalent to M uh, Amazon S3 bucket. And this is the next phase. There is a pod running in a Kubernetes that is you know, it goes to Azure, it gets the blob, it gets the serial number of that certificate, it validates as, as is, it's, it's comparing actually against the secret inside the Kubernetes. And again, I'm going to repeat that. So right now we have a pod running in our Kubernetes cluster. It has two variables. He has one, the secret inside the Kubernetes, and the other one is the newer one or more or same, same version as in the, that bucket, right? So if the comparison works and it's equivalent, nothing needs to take place. If it's changed, okay, if it's a different one, it will take it, it will update the secret, push it into the cluster, and you're good. You swap the certificate, everything is automated, you don't need to do anything, and it's free. Questions? Did I lost you guys? Okay, everybody knows, what's the, so what's the secret? It's the certificate. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, so another thing that uh, uh, we ended up having is a pod, a very fat one that has Ubuntu on it, some Azure tools. Um, it, it took 
a lot of resources. Not a lot, but comparing to what he did is a lot. And this guy had read and write access to the secret repository, right? And that's on security measures is, is like a bad practice. So we did a security consulting internally, and then we decided that this needs to be a cron job. Now, up until recently, Kubernetes didn't have a cron job. You had to do a pod with a cron job inside of it, but it still defeats the purpose because the pod is running all the time, and you don't want it to run all the time. You want it to run for the entire purpose of checking or renewing and shutting it off, right? You don't want resources in your cluster that are running all the time. So there is a, a cron job kind inside the Kubernetes. That it, same as the traditional way, you give it a schedule, you give it the task that it needs to do, and the credentials, whatever it needs to have in order to talk and do whatever it needs to do. And this is how we converted that fat pod with read and writes permission, and we turned it into a Kubernetes job. So we reduced the runtime, so this only works when it needs to work. You know, it does its thing and it shuts itself off. It's a very Kubernetes nice feature to save on, on resources and be very efficient and not have this uh, uh, creature that is have read and write permission always available. It's doing what it needs to do, shuts itself up, wakes himself when he needs to. And it's an, uh, yeah, it's an efficient use of our resources. Now it's the fun part. So this is, I think, that all of us in the room are doing some, co some kind of development. And especially in the Kubernetes world, the way you do the, the development is you're using variables, you're using keys for your cloud providers, and you save them sometimes in places that you don't need to save them. Like you put it in an invariable uh, variable, you put it in a config map that it shouldn't be there, and you're saying it's only for developing reason or staging environment. On production, you'll move it into a secret where it needs to be. So this is me telling you guys, and this is how I clean after myself, is I um, use our product, actually. Okay? So we at LC, we have a product called Advisor. And what Advisor does um, is scanning your Kubernetes cluster. It scans for uh, different security items like orphan objects. It's, uh, you know, during your development, you use this kind of a secret or configuration or variable. You forgot about it, but it's there. And there's no really good way to, to know it or to find it until somebody is saying, hey, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's this? And then the other guy is like, uh, I don't know. Can I delete it? Uh, no. Don't delete it. Why do you need to delete it? Because uh, nobody uses it. But if something will break. So we have a, <laughs> we have a very good mechanism of, of finding this kind of stuff. Another thing is, uh, as I mentioned before, is uh, finding uh, Amazon and, and Azure keys in config maps where they shouldn't be. They should be in secrets. Uh, finding critical, uh, critical versions with uh, vulnerabilities and, I don't know, mount to dangerous file system. If you see somebody mounted their pod to uh, Etsy pass W, right? It it's, shouldn't be there. It's either somebody did a really big mistake or you got hacked. Or you're developing for a security company and this is a normal thing out there. Um, and uh, yeah, we're reducing the readiness and, li and liveness. That's uh, features of, uh, of Kubernetes, of you know, setting, saying when the application is ready, when the deployment is ready. So we're, we're working with that to see if resources really needs to be there or needs to be taken over or taken down. Um, this is everything that we're finding out. Some of this talking to you, some of it doesn't talk to you, but we're widely around Kubernetes. We're focused on Kubernetes security, so we got pod security, vulnerability scanning, secret hunting, that's what we talked before, cross-cluster, so you, like in our case, if you have more than one cluster in different regions, you know, you're putting a template, 
you run it on all over your cluster, you're good. Uh, I won't bore you with everything, but I'll can, I can send you the uh, I can send you the big list later on, whoever is interested. But that's give or take my two cents on CI security and Kubernetes security. 